My name's Mike Sharples. I'm also from the Institute of Educational Technology. And I'm going to talk initially about learning at massive scale. So ever since its inception, the Open University has pioneered massive scale learning, initially with TV, with radio, and now with the internet. We've got over 200,000 students who are studying on our courses. So a central concern for us is how can we design effective teaching, learning, and assessment for education at massive scale. So in brief, some educational methods get worse when you try to scale them up. So personal tutoring, sports coaching is an example of that. It just doesn't work to do um, sports coaching for tens or hundreds of thousands of people. Some education methods are pretty much the same, whatever the scale. So I'm talking to you in this room now. There are also people watching online. They're getting somewhat the same experience. And if this was a TV lecture, there may be you know, hundreds of thousands of people who would be getting somewhat the same lecture experience. But what educational methods get better with scale? And that's a central preoccupation for us. Can we design teaching and learning methods that the more people who take part, the better they get? So there's something called Metcalfe's Law, which was originally formulated for network systems, which is that for some network systems, the value of a product or services increase with the number of people using it. An example of that is a telephone system. If you've only got two telephones in the world, it's not terribly useful. As more and more telephones were invented and marketed, then the telephone system became more useful. When you had international subscriber dialing, it became even more useful. That's to the user. Obviously, to the telephone operator, there are complexities, complexities of how to manage these many interacting people. Um, but they're, they're technical problems that can be solved. So in general, there are some network systems that become more valuable to users as more people are connected. But of course, we're not just points in a telephone network. We want to enable people to do productive learning. And so to enable learning, networks need to support effective conversations for learning that are new, important, timely, usable, understandable, appropriate, and most of all, trusted. We need to have trusted conversations for learning between people. And so that's what we're looking at now. How can you develop effective social networks for learning? Bringing in some of the findings uh, from uh, other social network sites like Twitter and like Facebook. How can we harness the power of social networks to support effective learning? And most of you, I'm sure, know about FutureLearn. FutureLearn is a company that was formed by the Open University. It was launched in 2013 in October. It has 40 partners, 130 courses, over three quarters of a million registered learners, and one and a half million course registrations. It enables people to learn on their mobile devices, where and whenever they want to, but it was based on a specific approach to teaching and learning, which we're calling social learning as a shorthand. And that social learning is how can you harness the conversations of many tens of thousands of people so that it's not just a one-way channel of communication from lecturer to student, but the learners themselves can support each other through productive conversation and interaction. To give you an example, this is one of the courses from FutureLearn, the Start Writing Fiction course, uh, put on by the Open University. Over 25,000 learners took part in this course from 139 countries. Every piece of content in FutureLearn is linked to learner conversations. So instead of sending learners off to separate forums, their conversations are always in context around the learning materials. And it works. This social network learning linked to the content really works. We, when we set it up, we really weren't sure whether people were going to converse around their learning materials. And we were initially pleasantly surprised and now pretty much astounded 
that people do engage in these productive conversations. Nearly half of the people who took part in the Start Writing Fiction course contributed to discussions. Over 7,000 contributions to one single discussion. And that was um, a discussion that was set up where learners were asked to produce their own very, very short story. And here's an example from that. Um, it's one that I, <coughs> I went onto the course and just picked one almost at random. It was a learner there um, who said, I got a bit carried away, but here's what I came up with. They were asked to write a, one paragraph with three pieces of fiction and one fact, and then one paragraph with three facts and one piece of fiction. And I won't read it all out to you, but it's quite a, um, a heart-wrenching, um, one paragraph, very, very short story. And another learner responded at the bottom, I love that last piece you've written, Catherine, heartbreaking yet beautiful. These are the sorts of conversations that take part, place on the FutureLearn platform. Citizen science. Whoops. So what I want to do next is um, say, how can we take this sort of conversational learning one step forward? And this is where I'm going to connect in with what Eileen uh, Scanlon has said um, about how can you bring in the power of active learning and inquiry learning. I'm just going to show you a short video that will introduce it. Citizen science is about curiosity and inquiry, forming teams to carry out investigations, asking the right questions, getting up close to nature, going beyond the senses, collecting data, finding answers, sharing the results. The Inquire Learning System and the Open Science Lab together form a powerful platform for open online science. We want to take the best of open university practical science and make it available to the next generation of scientists, not just to look and admire, but to get involved. You'll be able to design investigations, engage in inquiry learning, and experience the thrill of finding things out. Citizen science makes scientists of us all. So we're developing something we're calling citizen inquiry that brings together citizen science and inquiry learning. Members of the public not just doing other people's science, but initiating their own science investigations and using their own technology. So we've got an app, you can download it from Google Play, called Sensit. It unlocks all of the sensors on mobile phones. It's the first app to have done this. There's about 15 sensors on a modern smartphone, tilt, acceleration, air pressure sensors, and we've unlocked them for this um, social learning and for citizen inquiry. So you can use, um, for example, here the uh, uh, orientation sensor. Um, you can create projects using uh, combinations of sensors and um, you can uh, engage with other people, other people's projects. So you can either take part in projects that people um, have initiated, or you can set up your own um, citizen inquiry project. Some examples of the ones that are already um, underway. How would you use a smartphone or tablet to measure the height of a tree or a building? Well, you can use a tilt sensor. Find out whether birds are scared by city noise. Create your own portable weather station. Find out which is the fastest lift in your country, or learn about rocks, clouds, trees, and birds, or fashion in different countries. We put it all together on a citizen inquiry site called Inquire It. And again, you can go to that site, inquire-it.org, and you can see the missions that members of the public have set up there. I'm just going to show you quickly one of those missions, Identify Clouds. So we've got a whole range of people, um, ranging from pure amateurs who are just interested in pretty clouds up to climatologists and meteorologists. So one example of the latter is a picture there of somebody who posted up um, a set of lenticular clouds. It's a particular cloud formation and there were comments on that lenticular cloud formation. So we've got amateurs and professionals coming together, not just doing other people's science but initiating their own scientific inquiries. Another example there from a colleague in Buenos Aires is creating a noise map using mobile phones around Buenos Aires, posting the data and then sharing it with other people. So these are some examples of the sorts of innovations in teaching, learning and assessment that we're looking at in, at the Open University, particularly ones that get better with scale. The more people that get involved, the better it gets. And 
Just to finish off, we produce an annual series of reports called Innovating Pedagogy, which are about these innovations in teaching, learning, and assessment, not just from the Open University, but around the world. And they've been very successful. We've had over 10,000 downloads um, of the last one, and we're reaching that almost now um, from this year's or the 2014 one. Massive open social learning, which I put at the top, is only one of the many innovations that we've highlighted in this report. You can find it at open.ac.uk slash innovating. Thank you. Thank you.